The Orioles went to Houston and got swept by the Astros this weekend, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That may have been the worst Orioles series since really the end of the rebuild. I'll break it all down, but also tell you why it's not quite time to panic. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Orioles fans, today is Monday, June 24th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap, which was... By far the worst series of the year, the worst series in a long, long time for the Orioles. They are swept in a three-game set in Houston, really did not show a whole lot of life in this one. We're kind of run out of Texas. I'll tell you what went wrong, but also what went right at times in all three games. But why, despite a sweep and despite the Orioles looking as bad as they've looked all year, it's not panic time just yet. And that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. So usually on our Monday episodes, we roll through the weekend, get you the five things you need to know from each of the three games since I last recorded the Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday. But it's been a very long time. Since I've come on here on a Monday episode and have had this little to talk about in terms of positives for the Orioles. Of course, they were swept earlier this season in St. Louis for the first time in basically two years since Adley had come up. But even in that series, when they lost those three games in St. Louis, first of all, it was a midweek series. So I was recording about every game and two of those three games. It really felt like the Orioles had a good chance to win those games. They got some weird breaks that didn't go their way and they lost. So yes, the O's got swept, but you felt like eh, one thing goes their way and they at least win one, maybe two. That was not the case this weekend in Houston. There could have been six or seven breaks go the Orioles way and they still would have gotten swept. They got completely pants. They got run out of Houston. And that is why I say it was their worst series in a while, because again, there's been series over the last couple of years. They have looked bad, but they've like found a way to win game three, avoid the sweep, just get a W in there somewhere. So when you don't have that, that knocks it down the list. They definitely looked better in St. Louis when they got swept. And even the last time they were swept, you know, all the way back in May of 2022 in Detroit, that series was pretty bad. It at times didn't even get as bad as this one. So that's why I say like this felt like, except for of course the amount of talent that was on the Orioles team, Felt like a series you could have seen happen in 2019 or 2021. So because of that, there wasn't a lot of great things to talk about. So I'm not going to go through all the five things you need to know from all three of these games. Instead, a little different format just for this episode. And please, in the comments, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube page. And of course, leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you listen. Let me know what you think of the format of today's Monday episode recapping the weekend. I'm going to tell you what went wrong, what went right, and then just a a little shout out for each of the three games that the Orioles lost to the Astros this weekend. And we'll start back on Friday night. This was by far the most watchable game, as long as you stuck around till the end, and um, was certainly the most interesting of the three. Final score from Friday night, Astros 14, Orioles 11 in game one of the series. This game had everything. But let's start with what went wrong. And it's pretty easy to see what went wrong when you give up 14 runs. And that is the pitching across the board. Now, Grayson Rodriguez got the start in this game, and I wouldn't say he was terrible. His final line ended up being seven runs in five-plus innings, nine hits, but he was not nearly as bad, like not even close to that bad as that line would show. Got a little bit of bad luck in the fifth and sixth innings and made a couple of bad pitches, and his bullpen didn't help him out at all. He still struck out eight, walked only two, didn't give up a lot of hard contact, and he had 16 whiffs. Like He was getting some swing and miss. The stuff was, was fairly okay. Just made the wrong pitches at the wrong time. You could tell early in that start from Grayson on Friday night that the Astros came in with a plan. And that plan was, we are attacking Grayson early and we are attacking the first pitch. And they had seen probably on tape a lot that Grayson Rodriguez is elite at throwing strike one, at getting ahead 0-1. And sometimes he might throw a meatball breaking ball over as a get-me-over pitch. 
The Astros clearly were not going to let him do that. They bounced on him early. They bounced on those breaking balls in the middle of the plate. They got a run in the first. They got a run in the second, and they took the lead. And then Grayson made an adjustment, and it was kind of awesome to see him along with James McCann, who was catching on Friday night, made an adjustment. He started to throw different pitches, mix more on pitch number one, hit the corners more on pitch number one, and he was basically doing great until that fifth inning. He hung another breaking ball to Jake Myers with two on and two out, and that was the difference-making swing. Three-run homer in the fifth, flipped the game, put the Astros up 5-3, to three, and then Grayson just made a couple of bad pitches in the sixth and came out. And that's when the bullpen came in, and it became a nightmare. The Orioles, starter and bullpen, allowed nine runs in the sixth inning. By far their worst inning of 2024, Dylan Tate, technically got people out, but didn't look like he could. Jacob Webb literally didn't get anybody out. He went up there, faced four batters, two hits, two walks, was charged with four earned runs without recording an out. By far his worst outing of the year, Dylan Tate's worst outing of the year. I mean, I guess shout out to Nick Vespi for finishing the game with two scoreless out of the bullpen, but it was an absolute disaster. They could not anybody get anybody out. You just felt like the Orioles were drowning that entire time in the nine run six. So you flip to, okay, what went right? Well, what went right was that comeback by the Orioles. Now the O's, I mean, they did have a three to two lead going into the bottom of the fifth in this game. Like they had a chance to win it early. And then all of a sudden you look up, it's the top of the seventh and the Orioles are trailing 14 to three a day after they had beaten the Yankees 17 to five. And at that point, you're just like, okay, most teams would roll over, pack it in. You're not going to score 11 runs in three innings. Let's focus on tomorrow. Let's try and win a series when we can. But not the Baltimore Orioles. They continue to fight. And it started, you know, Gunner hit a solo homer, made it 14 to four in the seventh. And you're like, okay, that's nice. And then the O's put up seven runs in the eighth inning. You get Mateo homering. You get Santander homering. And you get Gunner hitting another home run. They get a couple more hits. And all of a sudden, you've got a seven spot on the board. It's 14 to 11 going into the ninth. And the Orioles were one batter away from getting the tying run to the plate in the ninth inning in a game when they trailed 14 to three in the seventh. I mean, Adley ended up with a five for five game, his first five hit game since opening day of 2023 in Boston. They just started crushing. It was kind of the weak part of the Astros bullpen. They didn't go to their high leverage guys. Nobody would when you're up 14 to three, but they crushed that middle part of the pen. And it was pretty impressive to see that come back to see no, no, no give up in this team. Just continuing to fight when you're down 11 late in the game and they made it way too close for comfort for Houston. And then the shout out, shout out to Orioles home runs as they hit a good amount of them. As I mentioned, two from Gunner, one from Mateo and one from Santander. Shout out to Santander. First of all, that was his 11th home run of June. That is the most home runs he has hit in any month in his career. And remember, we're still only sitting at June 24th. He's got another week of June to rattle off some more homers. And then also, it made it 20 consecutive games for the Orioles when they had hit at least one home run. That tied a franchise record. And then the O's went on to break that franchise record. Jordan Westberg with a homer on Saturday broke the record. And then Jordan Westberg hit another home run on Sunday. And the streak is still active. 22 consecutive games with a homer for the Orioles. That is a franchise record. So, you know, bad week and that's something to take out of it. And just a, a wild and wacky game on Friday night. It felt like it was setting up for what was going to be a wild and wacky series and back and forth by the two teams. But that's just not what happened at all. The Orioles, after putting up 11 runs and storming back and being like, all right, we've got Corbin Burns on the hill the next day. We're going to score enough. He's going to keep us in the game. We're going to win. The Orioles put up an absolute dud on Saturday. And coming up next, get you what went wrong, what went right in the Orioles game two lost to the Astros on Saturday nights. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Now, we are kind of at the point where it's just baseball season. I love sports. I really never want them to stop. But we got the NHL, and they got the NHL playoffs pretty much over. Game seven tonight, and then it's done. NBA playoffs pretty much over. But I want the sports to continue. FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up any bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. 
So head to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer at FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks, which for me is the most fun and exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. And Prize Picks is really the easiest and the most exciting way to play because on Prize Picks, it's just about numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch those winnings roll in. And even with the finals over the hoops action, well, it does not stop on prize picks. The WNBA is still heating up and with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves alongside greats like Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson, you could win up to 100 times your cash just watching them ball out. And if you're looking for promotions, well, prize picks, they have you covered every single week to help you with all of your entries. And that goes for Major League Baseball as well. So just download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks for a first deposit match up to $100. That's Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So what a weird game <laughs> that it was on Friday. Crazy sixth inning for the Astros, crazy eighth inning for the Orioles. Yeah, it was a loss, but you kind of thought like, man, if they can score like this continuously. They're going to win the next two games of this series and get out of here with a series win. Well, that's not what happened because the Orioles had a quite a stinker on Saturday, losing five to one in game two of the series as the Astros clinched it by winning game two as well. So let's start with what went wrong on Saturday. Well, it was the general offensive output, but really some bad batted ball luck. I felt for the Orioles, at least from watching the game. Now, they didn't crush the ball Saturday. They actually had, obviously, way more hard-hit balls on Friday. They scored 11 runs, but when they scored one run again on Sunday, they actually had far more far, far more hard-hit balls on Sunday, but I'll get to it in a minute. I thought Saturday the approach was still good by the Orioles. They ended up scoring only one run. It was a Jordan Westberg solo home run in the second that opened up the scoring against Ronel Blanco, put the Orioles up one nothing, And they only struck out seven times in this game. It wasn't a lot of swing and miss. They were putting the ball in play. They, they you know, didn't walk a lot, but you draw three walks, you get yourself some base runners. They didn't chase a lot. I think they swung at good pitches, especially against Blanco and his seven innings. It's just that Ronel Blanco, who has a fantastic changeup, we already saw him throwing no hitter earlier this year for the Astros. He's been probably Houston's best starting pitcher all year. He just had the Orioles off balance enough, just had their timing off enough in that game that even though they were swinging at good pitches in the middle of the plate, they were attacking, they just weren't getting the contact they wanted, and it led to only one run over nine innings. They only really had like one rally or two. It's not like they left a million guys in runners in scoring position or runners on base. It's just they couldn't come through and string a few good at-bats and good hits together to put some runs on the board. And and this approach, I mean, specifically the O's were attacking early in the count, which we've talked about it many times in this podcast. I've broken down why that's been their approach this year. It's worked for them a lot. They've been basically all year, not only one of the best teams in baseball, but they've been a top five offense in Major League Baseball all season. Full stop. You look at any stat, pretty much except for walks, they're in the top five. And, you know, most offenses aren't going to be in the top five in every single statistical category. They've been great with this aggressive early in the count approach. And a lot of it has to do with getting pitches to drive earlier in the count, because if you get to two strikes, you're going to get the pitcher's nastiest stuff, and it's going to become harder to hit. And a lot of teams, like the Orioles, their analytical departments and their people crunching the numbers are saying, hey, we're going to have our best chance to score if we don't even let the count get to two strikes. And that's how they have been attacking this year. The flip side of that approach is sometimes, not a lot when you have good talent like the O's do, but sometimes they've been shut out a few times this year, other games with one run. Sometimes you have just dud offensive performances because of the approach you have because if you're a little off balance if you don't have your timing if you're not squaring up a pitcher you're allowing him to get outs on you know the first second or third pitch pretty consistently and although he might not be racking up strikeouts and you're you're giving yourself a chance by putting the ball in play you might have some weak grounders some pop-ups some lazy fly balls and all of a sudden you look up and he's only at 90 pitches you know deep into the seventh inning and is able to kind of carve up your offense and it's happened a couple of times to the Orioles this year we've seen it you know when it is but I personally, and the Orioles clearly have you know, not outright stated this, but you can see by the approach, they believe in this as well. They will take the trade-off. If every once in a while they have a dud like this, 
They will take the trade off of sometimes they can score seven runs in an inning to get back in it. Sometimes they can score 17 runs at Yankee Stadium off one of the best pitchers in the American League to win a series. I will certainly take that trade off as well. And, and sometimes that dud just kind of happens again. I thought the approach was what it usually is for the O's. And just again, with this aggressive early count approach, you will have these games. You will. It, it will just happen. And it did on Saturday. Now, what went right? I mentioned the Westberg homer. Really, the only other offensive production the O's got, what went right was Cedric Mullins. Mullins going two for three. He had an infield single. His one out was a hard hit line out at 101 off the bat. And he had a triple in the seventh inning. 104 off the bat, hit it 429 feet, was about a foot below going over the fence for a solo home run. And according to StatCast, that seventh inning triple by Cedric Mullins on Saturday had the distance and the height to be a home run in 24 other major league ballparks. So there are only six ballparks where that ball doesn't get out. Unfortunately, one of them is Houston. One of them where it would be a home run would have been Baltimore. So if he just hits that ball at home, Cedric has another home run. Unfortunately, he triples and the O's because Colton Kowser got robbed on a, a fantastic jumping catch by Jeremy Pena. Orioles couldn't score a run there in the seventh inning. But for Mullins, that is now after he, he did not play Sunday. So this streak continues. Four straight games with two hits for Cedric Mullins. We know how bad the struggles had been early. He had only seven multi-hit games this season before that, and now he's got four in a row. And he's only, this is the big thing, he is putting the ball in play. And although his quality of contact hasn't jumped up tremendously, he's hitting the ball a little bit harder, which is nice to see, but it's not a lot harder. But he's putting the ball in play more. He has only struck out twice in his last 11 games. And when you put the ball in play more, this is the entire Orioles approach. When you avoid two strikes, when you put the ball in play more, you're going to be rewarded more often than not. And when you're a guy like Cedric Mullins with the speed he has, you're going to get on base more when you put it in play. And we saw it this weekend. Mullins had three infield singles in this series against Houston. Sometimes it just works out for you like that. And that is exactly what it did for Mullins. Fantastic to see him swinging it way, way, way better at the plate. And then the shout out goes to Corbin Burns. Now, Corbin Burns did give up four earned runs. That is the first time in an Oriole uniform he has given up four earned. But although he gave up a, a couple of homers, a big two run shot to Jordan Alvarez, he gave up a solo shot to Chaz McCormick, and it was at four runs through five innings, and it didn't look great. He still got through seven. He still only allowed five hits. Unfortunately, they were basically all extra base hits. And he still struck out five and did not walk anyone in seven innings of work. And the unfortunate part was like the Astros didn't square him up any other times than they when they hit the home runs. It was just like it was an all or nothing approach for the Astros. And with the O's offense struggling, that made each of those homers hurt a little bit more against Burns. I thought he was still good. And here's the other thing, right? Seven innings, four runs. You can make the argument that's the worst start he's had as an Oriole. It snapped his active streak of 10 consecutive quality starts. A quality start is six innings or more, three earned runs or less. That was the longest active streak in baseball, but he continues a streak, 11 straight starts pitching six innings or more. He's been fantastic for this rotation. He still, you know, in a game where the O's weren't scoring, still pitched seven innings, saved the bullpen. You only have to use one reliever for one inning in that game, which is nice to see as well. And didn't end up mattering Sunday, but hopefully when the O's come back home tonight, that will matter, not having to use too, too much of the bullpen despite being swept. So you know what? You have a veteran who even not on his best day is still giving you seven strong enough innings where if your offense was awake at all, you probably win a baseball game there on Saturday. But the O's dropped the first two and then moved it on to Sunday. You thought, oh boy, this was uh, the pitching matchup that looked the worst for the Orioles going into the weekend. Albert Suarez versus Fran Valdez, but... The Orioles have been known to avoid sweeps and been known to uh, get on some of the best pitchers in baseball. Unfortunately, that did not happen on Sunday. And the O's, it had been bad already. It was at its worst on Sunday. I'll talk about what went wrong again and kind of give the recap on the general state of the O's after the sweep in Houston this weekend. But first... This episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by SupplyHouse.com. Order supplies from the website that's made for the skilled trades. Find thousands of parts from hundreds of brands in just a couple clicks at SupplyHouse.com. SupplyHouse.com gives you 24-7 access to a huge selection of plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies with fast delivery anywhere in the U.S. Need help with an order? You can also get industry-leading 
after sales service from their friendly and knowledgeable customer support team and talk to a real person every time. And there's great news for plumbers, technicians, and contractors. Being a pro has its perks. Trade industry professionals can join the free Trade Master program for free shipping and serious discounts on every order. Over 100,000 pros already trust the Trade Master program to deliver results. Apply for your membership today and get a competitive edge on every order at supplyhouse.com slash TM. Save money and time when you order online. Order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from supplyhouse.com. Real people, real service. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by the DK Law Group. DK Law Group is a Maryland-based law firm who is redefining the legal process with their modern approach. DK Law Group specializes in real estate law, estate planning, business law, and family law. They are tech savvy, they treat clients like family, and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. And they know with the DK Law Group that speed is key. By leveraging technology, DK Law Group streamlines the process to serve you better and serve you faster. So contact the DK Law Group today at dklawmd.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners can call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mention the tagline, Empowering Legacies. So the O's lost the first two of this series. You thought it couldn't get worse, and then it kind of did, because the Sunday game at least in my opinion, was the worst of them all. Final score Sunday, Astros 8, Orioles 3, as Houston completes the sweep of the Birds and the Orioles, with all three losses, do fall to 49 and 28 on the year. However, you got to give a shout out to the Atlanta Braves, who the O's had just beaten in the series. Atlanta went into Yankee Stadium and did take two of three from the Yankees this weekend. So the Yanks did gain one game on the O's, but even after getting swept, the Orioles still sit just a game and a half behind New York in the AL East coming into tonight's game. So at least that is kind of the one piece of good news that came out of the weekend is the Braves did their job at Yankee Stadium. But in terms of the Orioles' lost Sunday, let's start with what went wrong. And it was kind of everything. First thing that went wrong was Albert Suarez. It was bad from the get-go. And I mean as early as possible because on the first pitch that Suarez threw, after the Orioles had left two on in the top of the first, Jose Altuve hits a monster solo homer to left field, and it's one nothing Astros, one pitch in. And quite frankly, it did not get any better in that first inning. Suarez labored through the frame, ends up giving four runs up to the Astros in that first inning, and that wasn't great. Now, shout out to Albert Suarez, who did give up a, another run in the fourth, but ended up fighting his way through five innings and allowing five earned, like it wasn't a good start. Like, let's be quite honest. Albert Suarez was really bad on Sunday, but he could have been so bad that he couldn't get anybody out and come out in the third inning. He still finished five, five runs, 10 hits, three Ks, three walks, and a homer on 78 pitches for the veteran righty. But this is two bad starts in a row for Suarez. Now, he only gave up three runs his last time out, but he lasted only three and two thirds innings at Yankee Stadium. And he left the bases loaded. Like, the Orioles got a key out to avoid Suarez from having to give up way, way more runs. Uh, at least earned to him in that start on Tuesday night. It hasn't been great the last couple of starts. Now, he hasn't been in the rotation all year. We know he had a rough start, and then he went to the bullpen for a while, came back to the rotation because the Orioles needed it. He's just not missing any bats at all right now, and it's not good. Like, the fastball velocity is still there. The breaking stuff looks okay. He's just not missing bats. Guys are squaring him up over and over again. And I honestly think right now for a while, I thought that, hey, whenever Dean Kramer comes back in late June, they'll probably just option Kate Povich back to AAA. Now, the fact that Kyle Bradish is done for the year screws that up a little bit. They could go back to the six-man rotation when Kramer comes back. But if the O's want to stay with the five-man rotation at this point, I honestly think when Dean Kramer comes back, I think they're going to put Albert Suarez back in the bullpen, probably option Nick Vespi back down to AAA and go with Povich keeping his rotation spot alongside Kramer. Now, Kramer made his second AAA rehab start on Saturday. He gave up five runs in two-thirds of an inning. Now, most likely, they pulled him out of there and had him continue throwing in the Tide's bullpen to build up his pitch count. Yeah, that looks pretty bad, but remember how bad John Means was in his rehab starts and then came back and had like the best start of his career, maybe, in his first start uh, off the IL against the Reds. So you don't need to put too, too much into those rehab starts in AAA, but there, there's still a chance Kramer would need one more rehab start either way. Because Kramer pitched Saturday and Suarez pitched Sunday, they're kind of lined up to be on, on the same line in the rotation. So whenever Kramer does come back, whether it's later this week or the middle of next week, 
it could line up easily to just remove Suarez from the rotation, put him back in the bullpen, and give Kramer that spot. I think that's what I would do right now. And and, and the other bad was was the Orioles' offense. It was the same kind of issues they had Saturday, just worse. They couldn't figure out Fran Valdez. They, again, had only one run on a Jordan Westberg solo home run. They had a couple of chances to score, really, but didn't get anything going. I thought their offensive performance, pretty similar to the things I talked about Saturday, just worse. And uh, that's why... This was probably a top five worst game the Orioles have played here in 2024, which brings me to the what went right. Pretty much nothing. I mean, Jordan Westbury hitting a home run. That's cool. Uh, Keegan Aiken threw a scoreless inning out of the bullpen. That's kind of all I got. I mean, I mean, you do have to give credit to the Astros this weekend, right? Their bats were red hot. They were not missing anything. They were on it. It was an impressive offensive showing. And I mean, for, for Albert Suarez specifically, you know, his last two bad starts have been in a, in a tough place to pitch against good lineups, but. The Astros are swinging it well. And hey, the Astros started this season terrible. They started the year 7 and 19 in their first 26 games. People thought, oh, the Astros, that's it. Like the, the dynasty's over. They're terrible. Well, that was the first 26 games. Now you, that was one third of their season so far. In the next two thirds of the season, the next 52 games, the Astros are now 31 and 21 in those last 52 games, much closer to what we expect to see from the Astros. At this point, they are now, I believe, 38 and 40 after sweeping this series. Yeah, 38 and 40. They're still a little behind in the playoff race, but I honestly think that the Royals are collapsing. I think the Astros are going to end up with the final wild card spot and get into the playoffs by the time the season is done. They just they have so much talent on this team. So you got to give props to them. And yeah, the O's bats were quiet late in the weekend, but you know they, they got to the rookie starter Friday night. They got to the Astros bullpen Friday. Saturday and Sunday, they faced Houston's best two starters in Blanco and Valdez, and, and they didn't hit him. Now, you want to hit everybody, but at least it wasn't against you know a couple of scrubs. They faced two of the, the better pitchers in the American League when they couldn't hit. And really, it's been an exhausting stretch for the Orioles here. I mean, they had just come off. I mean, there's no way to argue this. Toughest nine-game stretch the Orioles will have all season. Braves, Phillies, and then at the Yankees. And what do they do? They won all three of those series going six and three in those nine games. And honestly, in Houston was a little easier than those three, you would think, but continued a really, really tough stretch of the schedule. And they may, and remember, only one off day in the entire month of June, they may have just been a little out of gas. And that's what it seemed like, not as much on Friday, but really on Saturday and Sunday, it felt like the O's were just kind of completely out of gas. Now they don't have another off day for a little bit, so they got to just reset on the plane back to Baltimore and, and figure it back out. And, and I'm confident they're going to do that. Cause here's the other thing, right? Remember the Euros were swept in St. Louis. Everybody was like time to burn it down. The O's won five in a row and eight of their next nine immediately after they were swept. If you're worried about the offense, these two performances, maybe they were just tired. The two games prior, they scored 17 and 11 runs. I'm still feeling pretty good against this offense. So really it's just, it's just this. They come back home. They can reset a little. They're still just a game and a half out. They're still comfortably in a playoff spot. They are still one of the best teams in baseball. Hopefully they're getting Kramer back this week and they can reset it at home against Guardians. The team that's playing very well, a Guardians team that just in Cleveland this weekend swept the Blue Jays. Now, maybe that says more about the Blue Jays and how bad they are. But either way, Cleveland comes in at 49 and 26. Same amount of wins as the Orioles have at 49 and 28. It is a fun, young pitching matchup in game one tonight. Tanner Bybee goes for Cleveland. He's got a 3.65 ERA on the season in 15 starts. In his last two starts, Bybee has struck out 11 and 12 batters, including his last time 12 Ks, six scoreless against Seattle. He's been great. Great stuff from the right side. And then Cade Povich going for the Orioles was pretty shaky. Yankee Stadium walked five, struck out one, but only gave up one run. We'll see what he can do as he returns to Baltimore tonight and then i will be back with you tomorrow recapping game one between the orioles and the guardians and getting you any other o's news and notes that you may need but until then i'm connor newcomb and this has been the locked on orioles podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day